Hello, it's Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Bet, welcoming you to another episode of Bet Chat, the UK's number one betting podcast. And I'm super pleased today to have Gavin Durston on the line from Thrums Bet in Kirimuir, just north of Dundee. Uh, Gavin came to my attention because I was recently at Bet Dynamics and um, Gavin's practice won one of the Vet Dynamics Awards for 2023, achieving excellence through performance. That sounds very uh, grand and can mean many things to many different people, can't it, Gavin? Completely. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, please introduce yourself to the, the listeners. Well, Crook, I'm Gavin Durson. I'm one of the directors at Thrums Vets in Kerry Muir. So we're in the just north of Dundee, we've got four branches. Um, we're a very mixed practice. Um, our large animals, mainly beef and sheep. We've got some horse work, uh, but the majority of our work's small animals. Fantastic, Gavin. And, um, you know, I noticed one of my little uh, pet loves is uh, doing all things sustainable. And uh, looking at the practice before I got you on the podcast, I noticed you've got solar panels on, on the roof. How, how's that been going? And when did you get them put up? Yeah, they're, they're going really well. So we got them up in the springtime. And uh, contrary to what everyone thinks, so, uh, this part of the country is very sunny. And uh, we've, we've managed to be pretty well, el- not pay for any electricity for a lot of the summer. Um, and winter time, we're cutting down our electric bills. So yeah, dead simple to put up, a um, bit of noise. And it just sits there, ticks away. And it's, it's good. We managed to get a an interest-free loan from Scottish government agencies. And so instead of paying for electricity, we now just pay off the, the panels. And yeah, it's great, really good. Doing a bit for the, the local environment. Yeah, brilliant. I um, have a sort of aim of getting 300 practices to get solar panels on the roof because obviously vet practice or a veterinary industry, we need to decarbonize over the next seven to 10 years. Yeah. This is such an important time if we're going to hit some of these climate uh, targets that have been set. So doing things like solar is it is massive. And uh, I know you've been really impressed because you've also fitted a battery so you can sort of store energy as well, can't you? Yes, yeah, so we're still in uh, energy. Also, if we've got the batteries full, we can shift the electricity into heating or hot water. So we'll use as much of it and store as much of it as we can. We don't have our, our van's electric yet. We've got one car, it's a hybrid. So we just come in, plug in and drive off. So uh, I get to home and back without any carbon footprint, which makes me feel very special. Oh, that's great, Gavin. And of course, it is so necessary. I've been doing a number of talks over the uh, summer. And every time I do a talk, I started off by saying how you know bad the situation is with storms and floods and fires. And of course... I know the East was so badly affected by Storm Babette just recently, wasn't it? Which is these extreme uh, weather events are becoming more and more common, aren't they, across the world? 100%. So some of our local villages were just, um, yeah, just devastated some of the areas. And yes, there was some, um, in Brechin, just along the road from us, there was a, a whole street which was just completely underwater. And these sort of things never used to happen. So, for example, my folks have got a farm and we had a flood there about 20 years ago, and that's the first time the farm had flooded ever in 70 years that the family's been there. Mm-hmm. And anyway, since then, it's now flooded three times in the past six years. So it is definitely becoming more and more frequent. And yeah. it's, it's very it's tangible now. You kind of used to be climate problems were someone else's issue, but it's right on their doorstep. So... Yeah, I think we've all got to do something, but it's, it's difficult to know exactly what to do. But solar panels is dead simple and cost effective. Yeah. It's really obvious, isn't it? And I know, as you were saying, Dundee's a, well known as a sunny area up in Scotland. And of course, they're even putting some solar uh, panel farms up there, aren't they? Yeah, so Dundee, the colloquial term is Sunday because it's the sunniest place in the country. It's got other terms people use, but we'll stick with Sunday. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, two, we've got two local farms that have put in uh, dozens, and I think one farm's even got over 100 acres of solar panels up. And it's, yeah, it's, it must be viable. Yeah, brilliant. 
Tell us a little bit about what this award meant, uh, achieving excellence through performance. Why, why do you think you got that? What are you doing in the practice that, uh, you know, helped you to win that award? So we've been using Vector Dynamics for a wee while and basically the way we use them, they've got a, a very good dashboard. So they take all their practice data every month and they crunch it and put it into a very accessible form. So we can see what parts of the business are doing well and what bit, bits we're not doing so good at. And we can also keep your eye against other practices. So sometimes it's it's quite difficult. You're sitting in the office in the practice and you're not sure if you're doing a good job or not and you've got nothing to compare yourself. Yeah. So the dashboard's great for letting us see what's what's good. Um, the stuff we're not so good at, we just we pick on one thing at a time because it, it can be quite daunting trying to fix everything, which is I think is impossible. So we'll pick one thing and we work on it and we do a bit of a marketing campaign. We've got a... A marketer uh, practice me is perfect who helps us with that um, and by getting the data and then by working on something well and doing it properly and getting our ducks in a row we can see how things improve and once the things improve then we can move on to something else and it's, it's again it's really tangible better uh, client outcomes better patient outcomes patient outcomes and it just in the bottom line it helps as well so everyone wins with it i think that's a really wise point if we try and do 10 things at once, we don't do anything well. Whereas if you can actually focus just on one thing and put two or three months into it, it also helps to perhaps keep it there in the business afterwards when you move on to the next thing, because it's become a bit more hardwired in the practice culture, hasn't it? Yeah, completely. I think the, the stuff we're putting in place is we're trying, certainly kind of market-wise, we're trying to automate as much as possible. So once we spend a couple of months getting it set up, and then once it's set up and we move on to something else, it's still running in the background. And we can just, yeah, fix, if, if you can fix something, improve something. And then yeah. it stays improved for quite a while. Yeah, one of our value words that we have at Webinar Vet is Kaizen, which is this whole idea of the car manufacturers. It was Toyota, I think, brought it in. How could they improve that car that was broken to make yeah. sure it didn't happen, you know, next Friday? Yeah. Give us a couple of examples of maybe of things that you've looked at with the help of Alan's figures and gone, oh, okay, we need to work on that. And then, you know, the sort of level of improvements you've had. Yeah, so one thing, um, dentals uh, is your kind of classic one. So dentals in vet practice, like the percentage of animals come in who need dental work is pretty high. And we just we looked at the KPIs and we weren't doing as good a job as most other practices. So we kind of worked out and we kind of talked to the team about it and trying to get the team engaged initially was quite difficult. But then we did our, our marketing campaign. So we're internal marketing and also to clients. And we went from, I don't know, I'm, I'm making up the figure slightly, I, I don't know, two or three percent of our um, work was dental work. And we're now up to about six, seven percent. Um, so it's really dramatic um, differences. Yeah. And it's, it's knowing where we are is the key thing and then doing something about it and having a, that work we do lasting for a long time. So now the team are more in the habit of booking in and arranging dentals and talking properly for, to clients, just saying that prevention is better than cure, it's better to do a small procedure sooner than a big procedure later, it's cheaper for the client, it's, easier to yeah. do is more fun better for the pet which is the most important thing yeah did you know the webinar vet virtual vet and week congress is back for 2024 starting on the 5th of february we have 10 hours of continuing education with speakers such as sarah heath john chitty and samantha Taylor, and many many more we'd love to see you there and um, if you'd like to get involved again this year or if you'd like to join us for the very first time please click the link in the description below to find out more what do you do, Gavin, when you're not working in the practice to, to sort of free the mind and, and, and keep you cheerful? Uh, so I do, uh, I probably looks like less this now, but I do a fair bit of running. So I've, um, I never used to do any running at all. And then I got to my mid-20s um, and someone missed an appointment one night and I was kicking about for 10 minutes and I thought I've not listened to my heart for a wee while. So I had my stethoscope and had a wee listen and... I heard a heart murmur, which I hear murmurs in dogs, but not in myself. I didn't realise I had any issues. So I got one of my colleagues to have a listen 
and she said, you're stuffed, Gavin. That's bad, bad news. <laughs> anyway, she was wrong, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, so I checked out and I had a very, very slight prolapse in mitral valve. And that gave me a bit of a wake up call, as long with kind of going up a trouser size and being a slightly tight Scottish guy. I thought I don't want to pay for buying a whole load of new trousers. So I started running and I couldn't do more than 200 yards without stopping. So I thought I'm not quite as fit as I used to. And so I started doing 5Ks, 10Ks, uh, did a couple of marathons and couldn't get any faster. So I thought I'll, I'll go longer and I, I entered a, an ultra marathon. So I decided, I meant I'd seen the marathon sables on the telly and seen it advertised. Now that looks, looks good fun. And I said to my wife, I fancy doing this. And she said, don't be so stupid. That's a bad idea. And as long as she said, don't be so stupid, I was never going to do it. But then one day I must have gone on too much and she said, just book the bloody thing. Yeah. So I either had to book it and do it or I had to agree that the wife was right. Uh, anyway, my ego was too big. So I booked it and I did that. And that was just a really difficult, enjoyable, life-affirming experience. And yeah. yeah, it didn't change my life, but it certainly was life-affirming. So I decided to do more ultras. So I spent the following 10, 12 years, just every year doing one or two silly races, as my wife calls them. Yes. Yeah, you have to be slightly mad to run an ultra. I think I I run marathons and, and always found them a bit difficult, those last six miles. I remember the first one I did, I was 23. And um, my, my hardest training was about three weeks before the marathon, I ran my first ever half marathon. And uh, the half marathon went really well. I ran that quite fast. And then I got to the day of the marathon and at uh, 18, 20 miles, I thought, what is the fuss about marathons? These are so, so easy. And from, I think at 20 miles, I was doing about two hours, 20. The last, uh, the last six miles took me an hour and a half. Yeah. So it was a rude awakening to, uh, you know, the need for gels and uh, slightly longer runs than 13 miles before you try and attempt a marathon. So the good thing about ultra marathons, so most people know what a, an okay marathon time is and it's lots and lots of people do it, but few people do ultras and no one knows what a good time and all, so many races are different. So you can't really compare one with the other one. Yes. And in my mind, an ultra is basically it's an eating competition. So you start off slow, yeah. get slower and eat as much as you can. And as long as you're in a nice environment, it's actually quite a pleasant day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and whether I do a race in 10 hours or 20 hours, you come back to the practice and no one knows if 20 hours is a good time. So I can wing it. Yeah, brilliant. And I found that I enjoyed triathlons. I wasn't a great swimmer, so I had to work at it. But almost that was a nicer distance because it's sort of two and a half, three hours when you're out on the the uh the road and the uh the sea and things and and that was more manageable for me so i i take my hat off to you for your endurance and persistence because for these longer runs the, the preparation really needs to be spot on doesn't it yeah it's what you kind of get used to it but it's just like if i was just going to try and swim a triathlon distance i'd, I'd sink so um it's mm -hmm. worse Horses. I, I admire you for doing for swimming that distance. I couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had uh, Kira on the podcast recently, and she goes up. Not only does she do the distance, she does the distance at height around yeah. places like uh, the Himalayas, which I think is just adding insult to injury, isn't it? For our mere sort of uh, ultra or marathon runners. Yeah, Kira is a different kettle of fish. She's she's up there. I'm I'm a mediocre middle of the pad pack plodder. I'm, I'm happy with my place. Hats yeah. off to her. Yeah, brilliant. No, I, I I agree with you on the mediocrity stakes for myself as well. Obviously, Gavin, the practice I think is is a, is independent practice. It's it's really interesting to yeah. see how the veterinary field is adjusting at the moment, isn't it? Because we saw the rise of the uh, of the uh, corporates and it seems almost like uh, particularly being at that dynamics the other uh, month that independence has started to rise back up again what's your feeling on that yeah do I, I think every industry changes has got a sea change every 20 years and i suppose 20 years ago that's when corporates started to yeah. rise up and i think just recently they've, they've maybe had the 
their tails clipped a little bit with the CMA and they're maybe just pulling back a little bit. And I think there's a, a huge number of people who want to be in charge of their own destiny. And I think that's where all these Phoenix and new practices are coming from. And I think it's great. Okay, it might be a bit of competition at some point for me, but I think having good competitions, it's great. It just improves the industry in the way. And, and it's exciting to see what some new practices are doing. They're just adapting an old model. Like there's more membership practices coming in, on board. And I've seen a lot of that in the States and there's some, a few of them starting down south. And I think that's a really interesting model. It's something I'm, I'm dead keen to explore. Like we are quite an old practice. We we're going to our 75th anniversary this year. So we're an old James Herriot style thing. But I think if we could adapt to having a bit more of a membership type of scenario, I think it's good for the clients. Yeah. It's good for us, good for pets. I think it's, it's interesting. Exciting times, I think. So an old dog that potentially can learn new tricks then, Gavin, if you're 75 years old now, you're looking good for it. Or is that the practice? It's the practice, yeah. I'm, I'm still 36 in my head. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting because I, I was speaking to Alan recently again, and of course they're doing a similar thing with garden vets at Keel, yeah. which is the new vet school, opening that very much on a sort of membership basis. So it's, and I think Pickles down in, yeah. London is doing a similar thing, isn't it? So it's a it's a new model that's developing probably from the VIP health plans. Yeah. Uh, where we need to change those because of course I started one of those, I was one of the first to do it 20 years ago, as you said. And we were then using lots of ectoparasiticides and, and wormers and so on. And maybe again with our sustainability hats on. Yeah. Now finding fipronil in rivers and imidacloprid, we need to look at a different way that we do all the preventative health, maybe with more testing of fecal cultures, etc., before we just give out wormers or or flea treatments or the like. Is that your sort of thoughts as well? Or? Yeah, completely. We've had a plan for a while and it was kind of very parasiticide based. And then three years ago, we added in free consultations into kind of a premium plan. And that's going really well. So most of our signups now are on the premium plan. And I'm, I'm just almost going to press the button to having a, like a free consult plan with, with an option for parasiticides. So at the moment, it's, most plans are parasiticides with an option for free consults. I just want to flip it around. Because mm. I, I think the thing that drives the business, and I'm not knocking parasiticides at all, they've got definitely got the place, but the thing that drives the vet practice is people coming in and I think yeah. it's important people bring their pets in early for better, more successful treatments. And if yeah. we can reduce that barrier of that consultation fee and we get people in earlier, it's more successful treatment, um, better value for the client, it's mm -hmm. sustainable income for the practice. And I think that's a, a really interesting model. So there's a few practices. Yeah, there's um, Creature Comforts in London. They're just about to start with a similar sort of model. And then there's vets in Dublin who do something similar. So I think that's looking at what the, the industry is going to be like in 10 years' time, it's going to change a lot. And I think having a low barrier for people coming into a practice like included consults is a, yeah. is a nice, sustainable way to do it. Going back to you know the practice being an older practice, 75 years old, it can be really difficult to stay ahead, can't it? And to dis disrupt yourself, you know, the model that you've got that's been working, but you see new things coming, you know, the world is changing. I mean, the change is accelerating all the time, isn't it, with tech, et cetera. So it's, it's really important to have that time to also step back from squeezing the anal sacs and vaccinating yeah. the puppies to actually say, well, you know, what is the next stage? And I think this is probably what's also been recognised in that. Um, achieving excellence through performance award that you won at uh, Vet Dynamics recently. Yeah, definitely. And it's also just, I've, I've not, never had an original thought in my head, but I just used to like to steal other people's good ideas. And yeah. I think the moment there's, traditionally the, our old practice was, it's very much a silo. So clients used to come in through the front door and there was the gatekeeper who's the receptionist and they limited what the work we were doing. And then we started sending out reminders and encouraging people to come in. And I think now with so much you know, digital disruption out there and people trying to distract clients to go to Amazon or 
Chewy or any yeah. other company you can think of. It's important for us to kind of stay ahead and, and be very close to our clients. So the bricks are what we're really good at. That's our secret sauce, the people in our buildings and where we are. But I think digitally we've got to be there as well. So kind of if a client's thinking about my pet's not well or what's wrong with my pet, we want to be the first port of call that they think of. So we yeah. use Pets app, we use Vidivet. We've got our I think we're doing quite well just to be at the forefront of our clients' minds. And then if you yeah. can have a longer subscription, it keeps that cost down for the client. So at any point they can think, the pet's not well, I'll phone Thrum, I'll, I'll get in touch with Thrums. And I think that stands us in good stead. Otherwise, we end up just being a silo and other people are trying to attract clients away from us. And I think we could give a good service and we serve our pets really well. So that's that's important for us. I think Tom um, at Pets Up said it well when he said it's bricks and clicks, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I think if you just if you would just don't take that digital space between us and the client, someone else will, and then they just get distracted elsewhere. So that's it's important for us to do that. I, I've spent a long time, you know, before the pandemic, I went to a um, an RCBS meeting and. Nick Stacey, who was CEO at the time, talked about every business being a digital business. And I kind of really took that to heart because obviously we were a digital business. And I started saying to people, you know, whether you're a butcher, baker, candlestick maker or vets, you need to be a digital business. And I don't think people took it that seriously on the whole. I think, you you know, you're a, a, a an early adopter of it. But actually the pandemic has transform people they've suddenly become very adept at using zoom and other things and the pandemic as awful as it was there has been that digital transformation which i think has given some really useful uh, results hasn't it yeah do it's turned every client into millennial so it used to be just millennials who wanted to do online stuff but yeah yeah, some of our our older clients they're booking online they're using their chat facility and yeah the likes of vidivet and We've got all that stuff there, but it's so important. We, we don't really want to be working harder. We just want to be working smarter. So, yeah. again, part of our market, and we're making sure that the right clients are getting the right messages at the right time. And yeah. I, since we started doing that in the springtime, that's I can see real tangible benefits of, of that. So, it's, yeah, working smarter, marketing to the right people at the right times. Mm. And it just, yeah, it's positioning ourselves to be lucky, I think, is probably the best way to put it. Yeah, I like your idea of saying that you um, you steal ideas. I mean, webinar vet's very good at R and D. You know what R and D stands for, don't you, um, Gavin? I was going to say research and development, but I suspect you've got another to say. It's a rip off and duplicate. Okay. I like that. <laughs> I wonder if we could get a tax credit for that. <laughs> I should TM that, shouldn't I? But it's not been TM'd yet, so you can have it. <laughs> Obviously, you're an independent practice, and um, I'm always a, not exactly sure how this works, so please let me know. But I know you're also a member of Excel Vets. What's the benefit of being uh, with Excel Vets? Is that a, just simply as a buying group, or is it something more than that? You know, it's, it's an awful lot more. So it started off very much in the model of a buying group. It was very large animal based and it was a case of getting good deals for the, for the membership. And being honest, I was probably a bit cynical being a, more of a small animal vet to start with, but the more I get into it and the, the benefits are just, they're dramatic for us. So we get a, they're a very good buying group. They do buy in very well because there's such a, a large membership. But I think a lot of it is the community. So we join for the buying, but we'd stay for the community. So we'll have regular yeah. meetings. And the best example is during COVID, it's all new for us and no one knows exactly what's happening. So we used to have a, a regular weekly, fortnightly, monthly Zoom meeting just with other similar practices. And it was so nice to know that we were all in the same boat. We all had the same issues. And we just, again, R&D, we ripped off each other's ideas and duplicated them. And it was it was heartening and it made life so much easier and then again they help with a lot of kind of cpd so do a lot of leadership cpd so we've got a young ones coming through so our new grads can go into our new grad programs 
Um, there's aspiring owners programs, there's leadership programs, and it just raises the level of community efficiency within the practice and it just makes life a bit nicer, to be honest. Great. Talking again about XL Vets, that, that sense of community is is actually really powerful. It's it's often the way with mastermind groups like, you know, Alan's uh, Dynamics. Mm-hmm. Of course, the training that you're getting is really important, but you learn so much from your peers as well, don't you? Completely, yeah. It's peer-to-peer learning, it's stealing other ideas. So we, we would, we were quite a, as we were getting bigger, we we're quite a flat organisation where there are directors and then everyone else is on the same sort of level. And yeah. it, as we got bigger, it didn't work. So again, ripping off uh, some other Excel practice ideas, we've now got our... our students we've got our new grad program we've got our vets we've got a senior vet program and we can get up to director level so everyone's going to got a career path in fact one of our um she used to be our saturday girl ashley and she's gone from saturday girl to nurse to head nurse and she's now an associate management director so again it's just that nice career path and it's, it's like a proper organization as opposed to um me winging it Gavin, it's been fascinating speaking to you and it's great to see, you know, as an independent, you're doing such a, a great job up in uh, sunny Scotland. Uh, and uh, yeah, really appreciate your time because I know how busy you are and imparting some of your wisdom, it's been much appreciated. That's okay, no trouble at all. If anyone wants to rip off and disperse my ideas, I'm dead happy. <laughs> Thanks, Gavin. Take Thanks. care. Thanks everyone for listening. This is Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vet and this has been another episode of Vet Chat. Take care.